So we are actually going to cover part of Acts 21. You know, two weeks ago, Nathan got to, I think, verse 27 uh, in Acts. And so we're going to pick up also in, in that, and then we're going to go to Acts 22. Now, actually, I'm going to be spending more time in Acts 21 than 22, because uh, Acts 22 is basically the story, again, of, of Paul's testimony of his conversion, which, again, we covered back in Acts chapter 9. So what we've been doing, just going verse by verse, looking at the different scriptures. So I want to open up uh, in 20, back in um, 21, I want to go over a couple things. Back in chapter 21, we're going to look at verses 10 and 11. So again, Acts 21, verses 10 and 11. And verse 10 says, After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming over to us, he took Paul's belt and tied his own hands and feet with it and said, The Holy Spirit says, In this way, the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. So what's been happening uh, in the last couple of chapters is that Paul has been on his way traveling to Jerusalem. He's also bringing a gift that he's collected from all the churches, different churches he's planted. And as he goes, he picks up their gifts and he's on a trip coming back. And Agabus, and it's not just Agabus, because every town he basically stops at, they keep warning him. You know, somebody gets a prophetic word, don't go because you're going to be arrested, you're going to be uh, suffer. And, but Paul's adamant that he's going to Jerusalem. And this Agabus is uh, also the same one in chapter 11. I'll just turn over there real quickly. Chapter 11, verse 27 through 29. And it says, During this time, some prophets came up from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them was named Agabus, stood up and said, Through the Spirit, he predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. Now, this happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, each according to his own ability, decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea, and they did this, sending the gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. So part of what uh, Paul is doing, again, he wants to get back to Jerusalem, but he's also bringing a gift. And this uh, famine uh, that Atticus had prophesied came about. So he's bringing about a gift also coming to Jerusalem. Now, verse 12, back in 21... It says, when we heard this, we and the people were pleading with Paul not to go to Jerusalem. So in other words, when they heard this, and they have this same prophetic word coming forth, so their interpretation of that is, well, don't go, because you're going to be arrested, you're going to suffer. Okay, but... Remember, we, we talked about doing our Bibles and branch. We have a revelation, and then you have an interpretation of something, whether it's a dream, whether it's a vision, uh, whether it's a prophetic word, and then you have an interpretation, application. So they had the right revelation because this is what was going to happen, and they had the right interpretation. And I think with all of us, our thoughts would have been the same as they were. You know, well, don't go. Uh, but the ap application was wrong because Paul had been told clearly by the Holy Spirit, we're going. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. That's what I'm called to do. That's what I'm supposed to do. And so he answers them in verse uh, 13. Then Paul answered, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And then verse 14, 
When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, The Lord's will be done. So anyway, so he's getting this, this word again as he's traveling through these different towns on his way back to Jerusalem, all basically saying the same thing. And like Paul is aware of this. He knows, yes, this is what's going to be happening to me. But the calling I have is to go to Jerusalem despite that. Now, I want to drop down, since we covered, Nathan covered a lot of this two weeks ago, to verse 17 through 21. And it says, when we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers received us warmly. Now, the next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James. This would be James, the half-brother of Jesus, not James the former apostle who was killed by Herod, who was the first uh, martyr of the apostles. But this is James' half-brother, Jesus, who actually didn't believe in Jesus until after the resurrection. But by this time, he is the leader of the Jerusalem church. So he meets with, with James and the elders, and they were present. Paul greeted them. And reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. Now, when they heard this, they praised God and they said to Paul, Now, you see, brothers, how many thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are zealous for the law. They have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away. From Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. Well, first of all, this is a, a completely false accusation. He had not been doing that. And if you remember back in Acts, when um, Paul took Pete or he, Paul took Timothy, because Timothy was a His mother was Jewish, but his father was Greek, and he hadn't been circumcised. So to prevent uh, any problems with Jews, he had Timothy circumcised. Also, uh, in 1 Corinthians, I'm going to turn there real quick, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and verses... 18 and 19, as Paul's writing this to the Corinthian church, he says, Nevertheless, each one of you should retain the place in life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. Was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. Was a man uncircumcised when he was called? He should not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's command is what counts. So it becomes clear he's not telling the Jewish believers that they should not be circumcised or follow the Torah or the law. But at the same time, Paul is very clear that it doesn't have anything to do with salvation. In other words, if it makes that's their heritage, and if it makes them feel closer to the Lord, then go for it. Do whatever the Lord is calling you to do. But you do not have to do that. Now, this next section I want to read 22 to 26, because this is where it gets a little controversial here. So this is James, he's speaking, and he says, What shall we do? Now they will certainly hear that you have come, so do what we tell you. There are four men with us who have made a vow. Take these men, join in their purification rites, and pay their expenses, so that they can have their heads shaved. Then everyone will know There is no truth in these reports about you, but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. As for the Gentile believers, we have written to them, and our decision 
that they should abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, and from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. So the next day, Paul took the men and purified himself along with them. Then he went to the temple to give notice of the date when the days of purification would end and the offering would be made for each of them. And most scholars believe that this was a, a, a Nazarite vow, where they would set aside a certain period of time, and they would make a vow. They would not eat uh, wine or drink any grape products, and they would set themselves apart. Okay, And actually, Paul had done this earlier on his way. So he agrees to do this. But here's the, the question I'm going to bring before you. Now, I've read through this passage without, I don't think, exaggeration a hundred times in the past. And I have never noticed or seen this, or was it was never brought to my attention. What I'm about to say. So what I'm about to say, I'm, a, I'm asking a question. I'm not making a statement. I'm not making an accusation. I'm just making a statement. Okay, or, or a question, I'm sorry, a question. Was it really necessary for Paul to do this? Because it actually obviously didn't work because he stirs up a riot. But more importantly, and my question is, did James compromise faith in Jesus with faith plus the law. Because when I read that, this time, like I said, I've read it literally a hundred times before. I never questioned, never brought this. But it made it, immediately I thought of that scripture out of Galatians chapter 2. So I want to turn over there, Galatians chapter 2. And verses 11 through 16. And it says, When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, okay, again, they came from James, the leader of the church at Jerusalem, and he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. Now the other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. Now, when I saw they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, Now, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Jesus, and that we, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by observing the law, because of, by observing the law, no one will be justified." So he has to confront Peter because he had been with the Gentiles and not following kosher. And then when these people from James, okay, it specifically says from James, from the, from the church in Jerusalem, came, then they began to all of a sudden kind of change and they were afraid of what they were thinking because they were not following Jewish laws, and so 
they turned, and Paul confronts him. So that makes me think that within the Jerusalem church, you know, it might be compared today to many different denominations that there are different uh, groups within the Jerusalem church. Because remember, the Jerusalem church is made up of thousands of different Jews. And the one with the circumcision party, and I'm going to read about in a minute, there's another group of the Pharisee party. And where some of them still uh, not really comprehending that it's through faith. Because they're trying to get the Gentiles to say, it's great that you've been saved. And great that you accepted Jesus, Yeshua, as your Savior. But you need to do this. In other words, Jesus plus something. And back in Acts, I want to go to Acts 15, because that's the uh, Council of Jerusalem. Okay, well, this, That's where this issue came up uh, to be dealt with, because it was a constant battle between these different Jewish groups telling the Gentiles, you need to follow the Torah, you need to follow the Jewish customs. In fact, in verse 5 of chapter 15... It said, then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. So this is in the church of Jerusalem. Now, James is the head, the held head elder of the church in Jerusalem. So it just makes me question. And if you go to verse 15, we'll just skip. If you want to go back, go back and you study, read through the whole chapter there of what they dealt with. But in verse 15, or chapter 15, 10 through 11, and this is James speak, or this is uh, actually Peter. And he says in verse 10, or let's go back to verse 8. He says, brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. Now God who knows a heart showed that he accepted them by giving them the Holy Spirit to them just as they did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now, verse 10. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? No, we believe through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. So they come to that conclusion, but yet it seems like there's groups within the church in Jerusalem who are still trying to tell the, the Gentiles that they must not only accept Jesus and Yeshua, they must also follow the, the law. And so... Paul is continually having to, uh, to fight this, to deal with this, because it's throughout all the churches in, in uh, Turkey and throughout what they called Asia at the time, now Turkey, they were being attacked with this. With this. So he is fighting against it. So it just makes me question, had, had legalism not been completely dealt with within the Jerusalem church? Were they different sects within the that were continually uh, telling people, basically, that it's not just your belief in Jesus, but it's, it's the fact that you need to also follow the Torah. You need also to follow the, uh, Moses. Another question I had was, okay, so we're about to go to the part where Paul is going to be arrested, Okay. Now, James said there are thousands of 
Jewish believers who were jealous for the law. So where was James? Where were the thousands of believers when Paul was arrested? Why is there no record as as Paul goes to different trials, I mean, stands before the Sanhedrin, the different trials he put on by the, by the Romans, no record that James or any of the other Jewish believers stood with him. So it just makes me question. Again, I'm not making an accusation. I'm not saying a fact. I'm just asking questions as you read through it. Because I hate to get to heaven and have James come up, and the first thing it does is smash me in the mouth. All right, I just ask some questions, you know. But it, but it does make me wonder. And I think as you, you know, it's, it's all right to ask questions. You know, as you read through the Word, you see something that doesn't necessarily seem to drive. Ask the questions. And at first, when I went through it, I thought, well, is anybody else asking that question? And it took a while, but I did find one. Uh, I mean, a pastor in Oregon by John Corson, his name, who actually was saying the same thing. So then I felt like, okay, I can say this, you know. I do have some confirmation here where somebody else is asking the same question. So again, it's not an accusation, it's just a question. And again, I think it's good for us as we go through Scripture, if you've got a question, ask the question. It's all right to wonder. So anyway, that, that's my, my, my thoughts on that, is that the possibility that, that the legalism hasn't, had not been totally dealt with yet, that there were sections or sects within the Jerusalem church that still held to that, that you need to also follow the Torah, even for Gentiles, to be circumcised and to follow the Torah. All right. So we'll leave that, and we'll see if James punches me in the mouth later. All right, verse 27 through 29. And this is where Nathan left off uh, two weeks ago. It says, When the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul in the temple. Now they stirred up the whole crowd and seized him. Men of Israel... Help us. This is the man who teaches men everywhere against our people and against our law and this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple area and defiled this holy place. They had previously Antropheus, the Ephesian, in the city with Paul and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple area. So again, it's a false charge because he did not bring a Gentile into the temple because if you did that, it was an immediate death sentence. Okay, you, a, a Gentile could not go into the, into the temple. Now, as to this, this um, accusation that he always speaks against his people, the Jewish people, I want you to look at Paul's heart in Romans chapter 9 and verse 1 through 3. Let me find that real quick. Romans chapter 9 and verse 1 through 3. It says, I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit as I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. So I want you to think about that a sec. You know, we, we talk sometimes about someone laying down their life. Well, this is, this is a whole different game. This is not laying down your life for someone else. This is laying down your eternity. In other words, Paul was willing 
to go to hell, spend eternity in hell, if he could win his Jewish brothers. How many of you would be willing to do that for anybody? You think eternity, your salvation, and yet he was willing to do that if he could win his brothers, the Jewish people, to the Lord. So again, again, a false accusation that he, you know, what he was teaching, what he was doing, that he brought a Gentile into the courts, none of that was true. Okay, let's look at verse 30 through 32. And it says, The whole city was aroused, and the people came running from all directions. Now, seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple and immediately the gates were shut. Now, while they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. And when the riders saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. You know, it seems like wherever Paul went, he either produced a revival or a riot. And sometimes it was both, all right? There was no just coming in and nice visit. I mean, it was either revival or a revolt. And it's interesting, okay, so... Who saves Paul? It wasn't the thousands of Jewish believers. It was the Romans. So then I ask, well, where are all the Jewish, thousands of Jewish believers? What are they doing? I mean, it's possible they didn't know about it. It happened too quick. I don't know. But it just, again, I'm just asking questions. And 33 through 36, we'll go through that. The commander came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. Then he asked who he was and what he had done. Now some in the crowd shouted one thing and some another. And since the commander could not get at the truth, Because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. So he's taken into the barracks and trying to find out, okay, what's going on? The commander is trying to figure out why this riot is going on. And you can see that it's a a mob mentality. Now, some did not even know why they were there, what they were doing. So there's a spiritual component in that type of thing. When you have a a riot or a mob mentality, there's a spiritual connection with that that the enemy will use to stir up people, even to the point, like back when he was in uh, Lister, different places where it would stir the people up. They didn't even know why they were there, but they were angry and they they were adamantly wanting to kill Paul. So there's a spiritual element that, that's added into that. And you can see that even today where there's different riots that have happened in our past or nation and some of the riots that are coming our way very soon. You're going to see that same spirit that's behind that, stirring up, making it worse. Now, 35, well, let me go back. So the commander came up, rested him, and ordered him to be bound with two chains. Then he asked, again, who he was and what he had done. And some of the crowd said one thing, some another. And since the commander could not get at the truth because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. And when 
When Paul had reached the steps, the violence of the mob was so great, he had to be carried by the soldiers. The crowd that followed him kept shouting, away with him. Let me see if that's going. I'm getting some feedback. I'll turn that off. I don't know if that helped. So they said, away with him. Where have you heard that before? Exact verbiage that they used when Jesus was arrested and the Jews were standing before Pilate and he was trying, Pilate was trying to get him out, you know, because he knew he wasn't guilty. And all the congregation, all the Jewish people and leaders were standing there saying, away with him. In other words, let him away to crucifixion. So the same very words that they use against Jesus, they're also using against Paul. All right, let's go to verse 37 through 40. As the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander, may I say something to you? Do you speak Greek, he replied? Aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out into the desert some time ago. Paul answered, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Sicilia, a citizen of no ordinary city. Please let me speak to the people. Having received the commander's permission, God's, Paul stood on the steps and motioned to the crowd, and when they were silent, he said to them in Aramaic, Okay, so Paul was a very, obviously, educated man. He knew Greek, he knew Aramaic, and he knew Hebrew. I struggle with English, so I, I appreciate his language ability. But Paul is about to share his testimony, and... With Paul, he's always looking for an opportunity to share the gospel, to share the good news. So let's look at verses 1 through 5. And by the way, that the uh, terrorist, it <clears throat> says the 4,000 terrorists, that was in Josephus. It tells us that there were uh, 4,000 terrorists who... Uh, what they would do, they're also called daggers. They would have daggers, and then they would sneak in in crowds, and they would stab anybody, kill anybody who uh, was Roman or who uh, did business with the Romans. And so uh, there were a lot of innocent people getting killed, and then the Romans were trying to crack down, and they ended up fleeing to the desert, and eventually... That whole movement died out. But anyway, that's just a little history. So in verses 1 through 5, it says, Brothers and fathers, listen to me now, to my defense. Now when they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Then Paul said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Sicilia, but brought up in this city under Gamaliel, I was thoroughly trained in the law of our fathers and was just as jealous and zealous for God as you are today. I persecuted the followers of the way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. As also the high priest and all the council can testify I even obtained letters from them to their, to their brothers in Damascus and went there to bring the people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. So he's sharing his testimony, and he's showing, and I know what's going through probably his mind, it would, would also be going through my mind, okay, I was one of you guys. I used to persecute Christians. 
I used to do the very things you were doing. In fact, I was so zealous, I not only persecuted the Christians in Jerusalem and Judea, but I was going to foreign nations to persecute them. I mean, I was zealous. I was going after it. So in my mind, in probably Paul's mind, you think, okay, this is a way for me to relate to them, for them to understand, you know, that they understand, hey, I was just like you. I mean, it's like an addict or a drug dealer who is able to relate to other addict addicts or other drug dealers because they're on their level. They can say, hey, I was just like you. And so he's able to say that. I was just like you. I was zealous for the law. I persecuted Christians. So figuring and thinking that I'll have a way into their hearts because I was like they were, which is, we're going to find out, not necessarily true. So verse 6 through 13, we'll take a big section here. About noon, as I was, I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heavens flashed around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord, I ask? I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. He replied, my companion, my companion saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord, I ask? Get up, the Lord said, and go to Damascus. There you'll be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because of the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to me, and he was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see. So, I'll stop right there for a second. So, the Lord uses a man like Ananias because you sometimes might wonder, okay, so the Lord tells him, tells Paul, go into Damascus and you will be told what to do. So, sometimes we might wonder, well, why don't you just tell me now? But it's because... The Lord wants to work. He works through human vessels in conjunction with us. And so he worked through the man Ananias. Ananias. And although it doesn't talk about it in here, back in chapter 9, he goes through where Ananias was at the point where he says, what? You want me to go lay hands on Paul? Saul, the guy who's been persecuting and putting believers into prison? And he and Ananias kind of had a little argument with the Lord too. And let's look next couple of verses, 14 through 16. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witnesses to all men and whom of what of whom you have seen and heard and now what are you waiting for get up and be baptized and wash away your sins so paul's conversion was not exactly a normal conversion cuz i always think about okay if if you're, if you're an unbeliever and all of a sudden a blinding light comes on you and then a voice from heaven speaks to you, are you going to say, well, I don't really believe in you? 
I mean, it was not normal. It was that Paul was chosen specifically for the mission that the Lord had called him. And he says that you, you're going to see the resurrected Lord. And you're going to receive teaching directly from him. So as he went to Arabia for a number of years, he was receiving, seeing the Lord, the resurrected Lord, and he was receiving teaching from Jesus' mouth. I mean, Jesus teaching Jesus doesn't get any better than that. And so Paul calling was not what we would say at all normal. Now, what he didn't mention in this uh, shorter version of his conversion is that he was also told how much he's going to have to suffer for the name of Jesus. He left that part out in here because that's one thing that was told. And I, he will show you how much you're going to have to suffer. So before you get your, your little card with the apples, you know, Apostle so-and-so on it, are you willing to, yeah, that's what you're signing up for, to suffer. So anyway, a completely supernatural appointment of Paul for the ministry that he was calling him to. And it's always interesting to me because, and I think Paul probably thought this too, well, it would seem to me because he, was a, he calls himself a Pharisee of Pharisees, that he'd be the one to minister to the Jews, but yet it's actually Peter does that, and it's actually uh, Paul who is sent to the Gentiles. Probably maybe opposite, we would choose to do that. All right, verse 17 through 21. He says, When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple... I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking. Quick, he said to me, leave Jerusalem immediately because they will not accept your testimony about me. So the Lord tells him, get up, get out. And Paul, or Saul, Paul wants to argue with the Lord and says, Lord, I... I replied, these men know that I went from synagogue to another to imprison and to beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away. So, again, Paul gets a little bit of an argument. He's in this trance, and the Lord speaks to him clearly. Get out of town. They're not going to accept your testimony. But again, I understand Paul's thinking, because he's again thinking, well, hey, they know what I was. They know I persecuted Christian. They know that, so they should receive from me the same thing because they know how I was. And yet, the Lord tells him, no, they will not receive what you're going to say. They're going to reject you. And by the way, the trance he went on, there's a, uh, a discussion or a argument about this particular trance. If this one was the one where Paul says in Corinthians, where he was taken up into the third heavens, and he saw things that are inexpressible, things he is not allowed to even share, and that afterwards he was given a thorn in the flesh so that he would not boast more than he should. Because there's some that were saying, well, when he was uh, stoned at Lystra and thought was dead, that that was the time, but the timing doesn't work out for that. So it seems like there's many who believe that this was actually the time when he was in a trance in Jerusalem that he actually received this heavenly visitation. There's no way to know for sure. There's no way to prove one way or the other. Just interesting. 
All right, 22 through 25. So the crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Well, let me go back to 21. Then the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Now the crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, rid the earth of him. He is not fit to live. So in other words, they were listening to him until he got to that point about going to the Gentiles. So there's obviously some prejudice here because this is the God of Israel. This is our deal. This is our group. And then you're going to Jerusalem, you're going through the Gentiles. So that really set them off. And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and filming the dust into the air, the commander ordered Paul to be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and questioned in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. And as they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? So this is where Paul being a Roman citizen and not the first time and not the Last time, that him being a Roman citizen obviously was a, a great benefit. Because the Romans did have law. If it had been left to the Jewish people, he would have been killed. But the Romans had a set of law. If you're Roman citizens, you couldn't be put to death. You couldn't be imprisoned if you were not found guilty. So again, it, it's the, the Romans who in this case step in. And in verse 26, it said, when the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do, he asked. This man is a Roman citizen. Now the commander went to Paul and asked, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a big price for my citizenship. But I was born a citizen, Paul replied. Now those who were about to question him withdrew immediately. And the commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, into chains. So they were not even supposed to put him in chains, and he'd already been bound with two chains because he was a Roman citizen. Verse 30 the next day, since the commander wanted to find out exactly why Paul was being accused by the Jews, he released him and ordered the chief priests and all the Sanhedrin to assemble. Then he brought Paul and had him stand before them. So we'll stop there at the end of, of chapter 22. So again, there's a great benefit of going verse by verse through the Scripture rather than necessary. I mean, topical messages are great too, but when you go through verse by verse, there's a great benefit as we, we all learn together. We all see and we all have different points. We only have all questions. And again, as I had questions in this, it's, it's all right to have questions. You know, what's going on? Why? And really, you should ask questions as you're going through your, your daily Bible reading. If you have a question that doesn't make sense, ask the Lord, do some research, look up what some, maybe some other scholars are saying so that you come to that place of, of understanding. Not that we, and not that any scholar has complete understanding of everything. You know, it says we, we all prophesy in part, we all see in part. None of us have the full picture. None of us know everything. And so that's why we, we search the Word. We, we listen to other teachers. We listen to scholars. We read. You do research and do the best 
you know, that you can, and in prayer with the Lord, asking those questions. All right, so we're going to, everybody would need prayer for anything. We always want to have an opportunity for everybody to come up, receive prayer. You need prayer for healing or something else going on in your life. Feel free to come up. We'll have a, a song uh, going on to, while we're doing that. And anyone who would like to live or leave needs to get out, feel free to do that. And the rest of us, we just hang around and enjoy each other. So I'm going to end with a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you again for your word. Lord, we we just ask again that you would implant your word within our hearts, Lord. Lord, that you would grant us wisdom. Lord, that we would not be just hearers of the word, but we'd be doers of the word. Lord, that you would teach us your ways. Lord, Continue to work in us, Lord, to to renew our minds by the washing of the word. Lord, our desire is to be holy as you are holy. Lord, we want to be pleasing before you. And Lord, we ask for your presence and your power. And Lord, we just want more of you, more love, more power, more of you in our lives. We continue to cry out, Lord, in this place where so much darkness is across our nation and across the nations of the world. We continue to cry out and ask you, Lord, for an outpouring of your spirit. Lord, we ask you for true, authentic revival to be released. Lord, that is our only hope for this nation and a great awakening to come to this nation. So, Lord, we just thank you for your favor, for your blessings in our lives, Lord. And we just give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.